You are listening to the Star Coach Podcast with Meg Rentschler, episode 85. When people are focused on the threat and focused on the problem and focused on our vulnerability, we don't get the best version of ourselves. So I kept thinking, I think it's not just about helping people tread water, helping people survive. It's really what do we have available to us that lets us thrive? Welcome to Star Coaches, the show for professional coaches that brings you coaching strategies, tools, and resources. Whatever your focus or niche, take a front seat weekly as industry leaders, decision makers, and innovators share their wisdom and expertise on the ins and outs of successful coaching. Now join your host, Meg Rinchler, as she connects you with your star coaching potential. Hello there. This is Meg Rentschler welcoming you to the Star Coach Show, where we do another dive into strategies, tools, and resources that we as professional coaches can use to build our businesses and create success with our clients and get different perspectives each week on things that we might do, ways that we might show up as a coach. This week, we're going to look into a, a pretty common acronym that has been growing in popularity over the past decade or so. And that acronym is VUCA. We're going to look at what does VUCA mean? How does it impact our clients? And how can we as coaches meet our clients in this VUCA world and help them thrive and succeed and develop? So we'll talk about that in just a minute. Before we go there, I want to let you know that this episode is being sponsored by my mentor coaching programs. This is the time of the year where we as credentialed coaches might be thinking, wait a minute, does my credential expire this December? If you're an ICF coach, we are on a three-year cycle and our credentials expire in December. If your credential is expiring this December or even next December, you might be thinking about paying attention. Well, actually, I encourage you to think about paying attention to whether you're meeting your credentialing criteria throughout that three-year period so that you're not rushing to get it done at the end. But if you are getting close to the end or are anywhere within that three-year cycle, you have some criteria that you need to meet. Part of that is 40 hours of continuing education, of which 24 hours of that must be core competency continuing education credits. And then if you're an ACC coach, you must have 10 hours of mentor coaching to re-credential. Now, those 10 hours apply to that 40 hours of overall continuing education that you need to receive. And luckily, those 10 hours of mentor coaching apply to the core competency. So of those 24 that you must have of core competency, your mentor coaching can be 10 of those hours. If you're not ACC, but you're wanting some core competency continuing education, you might consider the mentor coaching program. It's a wonderful opportunity to get together with a small group of coaches and a mentor coach, and work around skill development, challenges, successes, building that skill set. Those group hours are complemented by some individual hours. And all together, you walk away with 10 hours of mentor coaching that goes towards continuing education or 10 hours of core competency, continuing education. However you look at it, it applies to your recredential. And the time is now we are beginning groups in June. So if you're interested, if you'd like to connect with some other coaches and have a good time because we do coaching and we get feedback and it's an all around wonderful time. Let me know if you're interested. There's a link in the show notes or check out starcoachshow.com and you can get information for the mentoring there. So let's look at what we're going to focus on today. Our guest is Dr. Ann Deaton. Ann is coming back to the show uh, in episode 25. She focused on her book, 
being coached, group and team coaching from the inside, and did a fabulous interview around team coaching and how to build a team coaching program. So if you haven't caught episode 25, I would strongly encourage you to download that episode and catch up with Anne. Now, you don't have to have listened to that episode to be able to get all sorts of value from her interview with us today. Anne is talking to us today about VUCA tools for a VUCA world, developing leaders and teams for sustainable results. This is her second book. It's hot off the presses. And Anne shares her experience as a leadership and team coach and group facilitator in our conversation today. She is a clinical psychologist who has been specializing in executive coaching for several years now. She was actually my mentor coach when I was going through the program and is an incredibly experienced, knowledgeable coach with this strong psychology background. So she understands dynamics that happen between people and in organizations. And she's going to talk to us today about the the way that organizations can move through volatile, uncertain, complex, and and overall ambiguity in their in their change for as things change, as things move, and how to, in fact, empower people through that. It's a dynamic interview. We talk about her new book. She is sending me one of her books so that we can give that away in the giveaway. So I'm excited about that. I think you're going to really enjoy what Anne has to share today about VUCA. So let's go to our interview with Dr. Anne Deaton. And I want to welcome you back to the Star Coach Show. Thanks for coming back and sharing your new book with us today. Yeah, thanks so much, Meg. Of course, I'm delighted to talk with you again and, and really excited about the book as well. Well, it talks about such an important issue, which is the whole concept of VUCA. Is that sort of how you would say the? So, and I'm going to have you talk about that, but the piece that I just, that just stood out for me is the concept of not just that there's this sort of volatility that can occur, but that you want companies to be able to thrive in the face of a changing terrain. And there is so much changing terrain that I love that you wrote this book to bring perspective to how can we thrive, not just survive. So why don't we start with talking about this concept of VUCA? And as I understand it, it's it's kind of how do we watch out for or pay attention to things that can affect an entire business and certainly the teams within a business, each one of us as we try to lead in the face of change. So what is VUCA and how can it impact companies? Yeah, yeah, really good question, Meg. Um, Yeah, so VUCA, and you're saying it completely correctly. (laughs) It's a term that was actually came out of the Army War College in the early 90s. And it was because the way in which we were fighting wars didn't work anymore, that things had changed and, and you couldn't use the predictable approaches and strategies. And so VUCA stands for volatility, you know, the up and down roller coaster for uncertainty that things aren't predictable anymore. We don't have certainty about if I do this, this will happen. Complexity, just sometimes the sheer volume of data, of stakeholders, of information, and then ambiguity. Um, So just kind of that amorphous, what am I dealing with? And so that's where it came from. And for a long time, I would say it wasn't in the business world. I I didn't hear about it till probably maybe 10 years ago. And then I started to hear companies talking about VUCA this, and you'd see an article in HBR saying, hey, we're a VUCA world. So it's really now made the transition into businesses and nonprofits. So a lot of different organizations I work with will say, you know, such a VUCA world now. (laughs) Of course, I just smile. But usually they are talking about a sense of threat, lack of having a handle on how do you do business in this VUCA world? Yeah. 
And just thinking about those four elements, how uncertain since that they make us feel, but just how vulnerable and unsafe. Ambiguity. I mean, people don't want ambiguity. They want yes. to know what's going to happen next. And and what I noticed in the book that you're writing that I had the honor to to read, thank you for sending it, is how vulnerability can make us sort of turn against one another. Mm. So and, and I think we see that as we coach in organizations when there's uncertainty, a lot of finger pointing starts to happen. So you created a different acronym for VUCA and, and sort of the antidote for VUCA and, and in, in your book, the, the tools that we might need. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about sort of the tools that we might think about when we're working in this VUCA environment? <laughs> Well, I love you saying it in a spooky kind of way as well. Yeah, you know, I I think so it kept coming up for me, gosh, when people are focused on the threat and focused on the problem and focused on our vulnerability, we don't get the best version of ourselves. So I kept thinking, I think it's not just about helping people tread water, helping people survive. It's really what do we have available to us that lets us thrive? And if we're aware of VUCA, then of course, we can be a choice. And what kept coming up for me is that our values, so the V in my VUCA, in what I call VUCA tools, the V is values. So what do I deeply value that's going to give me a compass, something to true back to when I'm uncertain and when things change? How will I make decisions? Well, you know, whether it's an individual leader or an organization or a team, if we know our values, that's going to help us stay true to those values and and really have a place of certainty and a foundation, a place we stand. Yeah, real grounding. Yeah. 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 That's the exact kind of verb I thought is grounding. And then the, the U stands for us. So we're not in this alone. You know, there are lots of other people willing to help us, to give us feedback, to share their perspectives. And most of us work on teams, either you know, small teams like partnerships or, Mm -hmm. or way big teams. So the us, the other people that can fill in the gaps for us that do feel at ease, even when we feel fearful or uncertain. And so, so the you is us. Well, Um, when you said that, even though we're talking about business, I thought about our audience and I thought about how many coaches in this uncertain world, work individually or work in their own businesses, yet there are partnerships that we can become involved in or organizations. So, you know, are you tapping into the ICF organization in your area or are you connecting an online communities of, you know, coaching professionals? So even though we're kind of focusing on the business, that that kind of arose for me that if you're feeling alone out there in the audience, in your business building as a coach, there are, there is us uh, in the coaching profession as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I I think, you know, you're exactly right. The us has ended up surprising me a little bit, if that's possible, because sometimes it is another coach. Sometimes it's, as you know, from reading the book, a horse, and sometimes it is an organization, somebody that has the answers that I don't have. And so, yeah, so that's what the U is, is uh-huh. us. And then the C is curiosity. So, and when you think about the volume of, of things that leaders are asked to do, that all of us are asked to do, part of what's overwhelming is just the sheer volume and the complexity. And when we don't know, most of us don't feel at ease. We want to know. We want to be sure. Mm-hmm. Um, So curiosity helps us to feel like we're moving forward, you know, that, yeah, I don't know now, but I can ask questions and I can learn. And that way I'm going to, I'm going to figure it out. So curiosity is just, you know, a tool that lets us learn. And lead us to clarity, you know, using that curiosity to to get a little more clarity. Yeah. Yeah. And then the A won't surprise you at all. It's aspirations. So you know, my first experience of hearing about VUCA, I, I think actually it was a, a federal government leader who shared it with me the first time I heard about it. And it was very much the threat of VUCA. And I thought, wow, you know, if it's a threat, then I know that we're all going to kind of 
freeze or, you know, flee or whatever we do or, or try to fight. But, you know, I thought, wow, when we focus on the problem, we do kind of make ourselves small. We do freeze or, or try to avoid it. And what works best for us, it's really to think about, well, where do I want to be? I might not like this. I might not like the feeling of vulnerability. But what do I want? Wow, you know, I want, in the case of the book, I want to have a thriving company again. I want us to work as a team. And even that notion of now I'm not a victim anymore. Now I'm looking ahead and seeing my vision for where I'm headed. And even though that's not grounding, right? That's not grounding at all. That's movement. Mm -hmm. um, But we already have the grounding of values. So now we get to move forward to where we want to go. And you do such a nice job with your book in telling it in a story fashion. I think people love stories and we learn from stories. So for those of you who haven't read Anne's first book on team coaching, which is Being Coached, she, A, I really encourage that you read it. It was one of my favorite group team coaching books that I've ever read. And you bring in these dynamic characters. So this book brings back our friends from from your your being coached book and can you tell me a little bit from your perspective as an author what what it what was it like to revisit your characters and have grown them this is about 3 years beyond the first book so it's kind of visiting our friends again maybe i had some reactions to some of the characters i've got to be honest you know and so what was that like for you yeah it it's been really fun cuz you're right there's about 3 years of their lives have passed about 3 years of my life has passed since the first book as well and so seeing that um they actually got to a really good place in the first book they they really made a lot of progress with coaching one another and being coached as a team or as a group. And so they got to a really good place. And yet now, three years later, they're in a different place, right? It's a VUCA world, Meg. So Mm -hmm. so things have changed. The terrain's a little different. And though they're they're approaching it much more effectively than they would have five years ago, they're not feeling as good as they did three years ago. And so it's been cool to see what's changed for them, where they've been in the last three years. And I know I mentioned this to you before, but but even sometimes I'd wake up in the morning as I was writing and I'd be like, you know, waking up and Jack would have decided he's going to go to equine coaching session. And I'm like, wow, I had no idea Jack would decide that. And it and it would surprise me. But they do have a life of their own and personalities of their own. And they each, as you can tell, have strengths. And they also have, when they are feeling vulnerable, bad habits that they go back to, which might be arrogance, or it might be being a control freak or perfectionist, or it might be finger pointing. But we all have that bad habits, playing small, lots of different bad habits that when we feel stressed, we go back to. So I'm curious, as you were writing, in many ways, I would think that writing these characters is a bit like having children. I mean, like you're, you're sort of growing them and developing them. So I told you that I reacted to some of them. I'm wondering if you, by any chance, had any particular favorites or ones that that spoke particularly to Anne. You know, I think Raj is still one of my favorites. So Raj is not a senior leader, but he's kind of a, a mid-level leader in the organization. And he's just grown so much. So I I love Raj. He's just curious. He loves neuroscience and I love neuroscience. So, and he's just got a nice calm manner and he's grown a lot in his confidence. So, so I love Raj. You know, I think I feel compassion for Jack. He's trying to lead a company and he loves to be in control and there's so much outside of his control and he's having to grapple with that. So I, you know, Jack's not always a sympathetic character, but I love Jack. I, I love his willingness to struggle with being in, in control, being the one who's calling the shots and feeling out of control. What I also like about Jack is his willingness to be open to the coaching uh, process and that he opened up his entire team to coaching. He uh, works really hard to 
allow input and thank people for their input and be open even if it makes them uncomfortable. So there's a level of vulnerability in him and openness to his team that I find inspirational. Yeah, and you might remember from being coached that one of the ways he got there was he had a chief people officer in being coached who really was a good mirror for him. Mm -hmm. They were good mirrors for one another and good partners. So, yeah. So I noticed the growth in Jack from book one to book two Mm -hmm. and and Jack as the CEO of the corporation, correct? Yeah. 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 So how much of the concepts that you bring into exploring the the struggles that an organization can go through are built upon some of the things that you've seen in the organizations you've coached? Mm. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. So we've all seen leaders like this. We've all seen teams that something changes in the external environment. And so they don't, you know, they have been really successful and suddenly the pipeline dries up and they don't have business or a competitor moves into the area. So so we've all seen, I think, I hope organizations at their best really just thriving and flying. And we've also seen organizations when they're kind of hunkered down, trying to make sure if only some of us are going to survive, I want it to be me and not you. And so, yeah, very much. And I would say also the variety of ways that that people approach it. So Sometimes we imagine one answer, one approach can work for every company and every leader, but of course it doesn't. We're all very different. And so what I what I especially love about tech environments is they try a lot of different approaches and they kind of get that some will work for some people and some will work for others. And we actually need to have a diverse array of tools so that we have some common ground, some communication, but also so it takes advantage of who we are uniquely and we each have our perhaps favorite tools. So when we think about the book and using the book as a tool, it's sort of broken into the first two parts are a bit of a story or a fable, gets into the characters and what the characters are going through and how they're looking at the crisis, it really kind of starts with a crisis. And then it looks at the VUCA tools that you bring into it and resources. So if I was either a coach using the book or maybe recommending this book for a client to use, how do you, what would you recommend as the best way to approach the book to get the best oomph from it, the best benefit from the book. Yeah, I'm a fan of stories, Meg. So I, I always think reading, read the story, you know, and figure out like, who do I identify with? Who drives me crazy? And and it's a quick read. So it's not especially burdensome. And a lot of our clients are super busy, right? So mm-hmm. So sometimes I will actually just based on what, what a client's dealing with say, hey, why don't you read this this chapter about Arun? Because Arun's in a bit of trouble. Read this chapter and see what you think, you know, because you're feeling like you're in a bit of trouble right now. So maybe this will be useful to you. So I don't know that there's any one approach. You can also go straight to the end of the book and focus on the tools. I hope if readers do that, they will then read the story because I hope they would get intrigued. But of course, some people really prefer didactic and just knowing like what's the model and so forth. And so that's an approach. But honestly, I wrote it in the order that it is. So the story came first for me. And then I thought about what is it that readers would like to take a deeper dive into. Excellent. One of the things that really resonated with me, particularly with all that's going on in the media and in the in sort of society right now in confronting harassment and confronting the, the the negativity that can happen in organizations and in in entire in entire disciplines or entire industries and so you you face the concept of bullying in your book and both in in the workplace and there's an issue of a child being bullied in the book so what 
makes this important to you or what made it important for you to, to, to include in, in your work? Yeah, you're exactly right about the climate right now. And obviously, I was writing this a little while ago before the Me Too and before some of these things were coming up. But the, the entire time I've worked with organizations and been in organizations, I've seen bullying, right? I've mm-hmm. seen people misbehaving with one another. Sometimes it's it's minor, just being rude or dismissive, mm-hmm. and sometimes very significant. And sometimes it's because of the power differential that the intention isn't to be a bully. It's just when somebody in power speaks strongly, another person might feel like my voice is not welcome. So just bullied in that sense. But in this book, we have a bit of a bully. You know, he he's just sure of himself and sure of what he knows. And sometimes when you know what you know, you actually aren't that open to what others know or what their approach might be. So so he is a bit of a bully and it starts to impact the reputation of the company and their ability to retain good people. And that happens, right? That in companies, we all know people lead because bosses, they lead because they're dissatisfied. And sometimes that's the emotional climate of the company. Mm -hmm. Um, And of course, the chief people officer, when he hears about that, when he starts to understand the extent of the problem, both in retention and recruiting, he realizes they can't afford to ignore it. Well, and more and more, I think we're beginning to realize what's the cost. So even if somebody is bringing value, what's the cost in their delivery and in the way that they treat others to the the value that they bring? Is that really worth the, I think companies are having to, and industries are having to, to revisit the belief that at any cost, we'll keep this person because of the money value they bring in. And is it really... Is it really worth that? Yeah. 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 And I know you had a speaker not too long ago. I'm not sure who it was who talked about emotional intelligence. And so, you know, you think about emotional intelligence and the people that we love working with, the best leaders that come to mind are people that care about people. And yes, they also have technical skills. They're also smart. But technical skills alone isn't what will make somebody inspire you and make you kind of do that discretionary effort, that that extra effort when things get tough. That's the emotional intelligence piece. Mm-hmm. And so so it's really not okay for, for leaders not to work on their people skills as well as their technical expertise. We need both. Right. To be able to, to bring that forward, which brings us back to the VUCA tools. And when, when you thought about your VUCA tools and, and uh, put those together, who are they really for? I mean, are they for coaches? Are they for leaders? Are they for HR? Who do you see and who did you sort of direct your book towards as you wrote your book? Yeah. Uh, so I think that my experience with the first book was I was writing it for coaches. Uh huh. And then the feedback I got about the first book was leaders were reading it people officers, OD professionals were reading it, and coaches were reading it. So I think it's for anyone who's having an experience of VUCA that they would really just like a way to get a handle on it. Just, you know, it's, I haven't written it for coaches in the sense that it is heavy on the terminology or that it's unapproachable. I think I've tried to make it approachable no matter what your background is. And I can attest that I think that not only is it a valuable tool for myself as a coach, but I can certainly see using it as a tool with my clients who might very well be leaders and they might be HR professionals. I mean, we, we coach lots of different arenas and I don't know anywhere where there isn't VUCA, the negative VUCA. So let's bring in the, the antidote for that and, and, and help build around that. So anything else about your book that you wanted to be able to share or about your philosophy as we wrap up our time together today? Well, I was realizing when we were talking about bullies that you also asked about outside the company, you know, how how they're dealing with bullies. So in the first book, one of the leaders in the company, son was being bullied. And so he actually left the company, left the city so his son could have a fresh start. And, And Edgar is back in this book. His son has gotten his confidence back. 
and his son now is a teenager and wants to actually take action to prevent bullying. And so father and son get to work a little bit together on that. And and actually, the company, Tech Environments, gets to have an impact in their community by bringing this to the schools. And so, again, very true to my life that many of the companies I work with will find that that their employees want to volunteer anyway. And when they do that as a company with some kind of initiative in the community, it brings them together. It makes them a better company. But it also, going back to the us, it connects them with the community and helps them have a positive impact. Yeah, I was thrilled to see that Edgar came back and that his son was making a choice to to re-enter his old community with a different perspective. And that was a, a shiny light for me in the book. Thank you, Anne, for bringing your tools and your expertise to us, shining a light on the reality of VUCA and then what we can do in response to that. It is always a pleasure to have you here with us. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me back, Meg. I look forward to next time. Absolutely. Take care. You too. Change and uncertainty and difficulty are sometimes just a given. And how we, in fact, help our clients thrive in those environments is a challenge at times. And I thank Dr. Ann Deaton for joining us today to give us some tools on how we might face those challenges with our clients. If you'd like to know more about Ann or about her books, visit the resource page at Star coachshow.com. In addition, while you're on the website, check out the other resources on the page and the free giveaways that our guests have available for our listeners, as well as signing up for the book giveaway on the contact page. I want to remind you that this show is being sponsored by the Mentor Program, and you can get more information about the Mentor Coaching Program on the Star Coach Show website. We'd love to have you join us and participate, build those coaching muscles, spend time with other coaches, break away from feeling isolated, and increase your confidence as a coach while you have a whole lot of fun getting a lot of hours of coaching for really great price. So we have an early bird special that goes into the beginning of June. Check it out. Let me know if you'd like to join. One more request. If you're enjoying the show, I would very much appreciate a rate and review on iTunes as it increases the visibility of the show. And I want to thank all of you who have been sharing the show with your friends and other coaches that you think would benefit from the show. Our listening audience is growing by leaps and bounds every day. And I hope that it continues to do so because I like for its strategies, tools, and resources to be shared and the wisdom of our guests to be shared across the coaching community. So until next week, this is your host, Meg Rentschler, wishing you the very best for your coaching success. Have a fabulous week.